Claire Edwards, and you're listening to Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today, I bring you a fascinating conversation with Jane Hemingway Moore, founder and head coach of Leading Edge Professional Development. Our conversation centers on leadership in action, focusing on building leadership and high-performing team capabilities in real time and in a very special environment. I'm going to leave it there and let your sense of curiosity do the rest. Enjoy. I was introduced to Jane Hemingway Moore after chatting with a participant in a webinar I was running about the neuroscience of change. So I went to meet Jane, whose business is literally a stone's throw away from where I live. Well, in the car. Um, Jane's the founder and head coach of Leading Edge Professional Development. She has extensive corporate leadership experience, both in Australia and internationally. And when we met face to face, we found out just how small the world is. As head coach, Jane now works with a number of co-coaches who are experts in their field. They tell it like it is. They're exceptionally intuitive and totally authentic. Why? Because these co-coaches are horses. And this is what we're going to be exploring today. Leadership in action. There are so many aspects of leadership that horses can unveil in us humans, both good and developmental. And today we'll be focusing on three key areas. So Jane, welcome to Authentic Leadership. Well, thank you so much, Claire. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. Yeah, I am so looking forward to this conversation. So, um, oh dear, I can't avoid the puns. Before we trot off <laughs> <laughs> into the into the world of, of horse coaching, I'd love you to share some of your your own leadership journey with our listeners and how how you came to be doing what you're doing today. And also maybe share that um, that serendipity in our corporate lives. Yeah, for sure, for sure, Claire. Okay, well, um, I love the pun, by the way, trotting off. Uh, that's very, very good. Um, so interestingly, I think I kind of fell into this um, absolute interest in leadership uh, through many of my jobs I'd had. So um, you mentioned that I'd worked internationally and that's uh, where we also see how small this world is, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I was working for a company in Germany called SAP, a um, large software company that I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of. And I have to say I was just a member of a team there and the team actually really role modelled what to me it was like to have um, a really uh, great uh, role model of what leadership can look like in a company. Um, they called it at the time like a flat hierarchy. So we just had the one kind of, um, I'll say the word boss, but, but this particular boss of mine was a great leader. Um, it, and uh, with that kind of title who kind of uh, set the direction for the department. And otherwise, we were all given a voice. We all felt heard, we all felt seen, and we all felt um, understood. And it was a really great model for me in leadership. And I could see how with a model like that, that, you know, people who might have been a little shy and unsure, and I was at the time, I was only in my early 20s, and I have to say, I kind of thought, gosh, who might have been this amazing team? But he kind of allowed us all to show our strengths, to speak up. If he felt we were being quiet in a meeting, he would ask us without putting us on the spot. It was a really great um, model for me of leadership. Um, you know, on the contrary, in other companies, I've had the antithesis of what I think is a good leader. And so this is where it became really fascinating for me, like what does make a good leader? Um, in those roles, I've had people kind of, um, you know, it's been all about the authority, doing what I say, um, no leeway, no, you know, setting really, um, really hard boundaries, uh, you know, being rather rude. Um, and that was their kind of way of getting things done, but it did not appeal to me one, in one iota of a way. 
Um, yeah. I think that um, I think that you know, with the horses, bringing the horses into it is that horses actually, in their natural state, they in herds, they model this beautiful um, shared leadership. So, yes, we all know Hollywood and there's a stallion running out the front and he's the big boss. Well, that's actually false. <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't actually happen. Um, you know, the horse at the front's usually a mare, by the way, <laughs> a female horse, um, and the stallion's at the back. So they all have different roles and there are horses that are leaders kind of at the sides as well, keeping the whole community safe. And I think that that's what we all want to feel, don't we, safe, and we want to have that feeling from our leaders. Um, so they they actually model that leadership that was modelled to me um, back in SAP as well. Wow. I know, it's pretty amazing. And um, just back to our story as well, Claire, uh, when Claire came to meet us, as she mentioned, she came into the office to meet us and was um, beautifully interested in what we do and we saw the the parallels in in the way we both you know um, look at leadership which is fantastic and then we got chatting and Claire was like well I work for um, SAP and I was like oh my gosh I work for SAP <laughs> and she's like SAP UK and I was like oh, you don't happen to know um, you know Fiona who was in Ireland and she's like oh my gosh she's like one of my best friends and I'm like well she's one of my best friends <laughs> it's amazing and she she um Fiona's actually my daughter's goddaughter so a godmother so that's that's how, cl- how close we are as well so in that moment we took a rather um funny selfie didn't we Claire and we said, did we did our friend, and she's delighted that we are working together and and thinks that you know it will just uh you know that serendipity was kind of exactly that meant to be in a way it most certainly, certainly was. I think you've just epitomized leadership in action because that's what we what we were talking about before we before we came onto the podcast is it, we've chosen a really interesting um, title for the podcast, Leadership in Action. And you know, everything that you've been talking about is is twenty first century leadership where, It's not so hierarchical. It is more democratized. The boundaries are not so hard. The authority is not so strict. And and what you were saying about allowing people's strengths to come out. And I think that's, you know, that that's what certainly, um, well, I'm not, I I was going to say younger people, but I think that's what everybody wants from leaders today. Um, So tell, tell me a little bit more about, the role of the horses in helping bring this out? Well, the amazing thing about working with horses is, you know, of course they don't judge us for anything that we humans tend to judge each other on, if that makes sense. So yeah. you know, they don't they don't look at us when we arrive here to work with them or whatever and say, oh, you know, she doesn't have Nike sneakers on or you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're not looking at brands they don't know our title they don't go oh better respect that guy he's the ceo or oh gosh no she's the hr director better be you know better not walk away from her or whatever they're just literally responding to the real you yeah so it's amazing what emerges when we are working with a group of people so you know for example um When I started out this work, this is another thing that got me so fascinated in the leadership thing. We had a corporate group here from um, a large Australian bank and um, I didn't, I was also training some people so I can train people to do this work that I do with horses as well. Uh Um, And uh, I had a group here and and my, my client was fully aware that I had trainees here as well observing and they were fine with that. And I hadn't told my group anything much about the group except that they were from this large bank. Mm -hmm. And so we went in, we did the program. So what happens in our program is we get it, we have a group of people, um, we split them into teams. And um, so we split that group into smaller groups. And then that small group gets um, a, a horse as another team member. Mm-hmm. So they work together in this little team, um, this little herd, <laughs> if you want, yeah. um, with their horse together, and they negotiate some obstacles. So. Um, And each of our programs has an objective and we've spoken to our clients about what that objective is, what they want to achieve for their team. 
So on this particular day, we had uh, this, this group here and they actually wanted to focus on um, building relationships. So that's what they thought was a little bit lacking in their team. Uh-huh. We put them into their groups and they started working and we went through the program and the horses were, um, we often say they're speaking loudly, which is just using mainly their body language and telling us kind of what was going on in the dynamics of each group. So at the end of it, um, we do a debrief as well. And the importance of that debrief is not that these people have successfully worked with horses, because obviously what good is that in the corporate world in one way? It's how we parallel those back to um, how they can use them in their in the workplace, how they can do what they've learned about themselves and their team in the workplace. So we did all this and then the, the client left and they were pretty um, happy with, with how it went. They all learned a lot. Um, a little side note on that, it can be a little confronting sometimes because the horses tell it like it is. Yeah. So things get showing up that, you know, make, you might have as a human being trying to say, no, I am confident or yes, I am this. And the horse is like, yeah, no, I'm not feeling it and kind of brings that up. But anyway, it all went very, very well and the, the client got a lot out of it and afterwards I asked my trainees who they thought the leader, like the titled boss or leader of that group was, mm. and no one guessed the actual title boss. Interesting. And from from what perspective? Well, it was about with the horses, they actually look for leadership. They look for leadership. And if they don't find leadership, they become the leader. So for a horse, if you can imagine horses out in the wild, that horse herd, all they need to do is to be feel, they need to feel safe, right? Mm. They need to feel safe. And I think, as I said, I think I said that before, I think us humans just want to feel safe as well. So one thing about feeling safe is having a leader that we feel that we can, you know, put our trust in and follow kind of thing. And so if they don't feel that, so it it actually emulates it really, really well in our little group. So if they don't feel that, then one of the horses steps up to be the leader. So that can look like things like, so if you imagine a group of two, three people and a horse, they're looking at an obstacle. It might be stepping over some poles. It might be weaving through some, um, you know, traffic cones. Uh, It could be... um, going backwards through something. There's all sorts of different things. Hmm. If you don't have your horse along, feeling part of that team, he's not going to respond and come with you. So he might do a number of things. So this is what it looks like. He might plant his feet. And believe me, you cannot persuade a 500-plus kilogram animal to go with you if he doesn't want to. (laughs) Yes, I've experienced that. Yes, exactly. So you just can't. And, oh, by the way, I should mention that all the work is done from the ground. We don't ride the horses because yeah. we want the horses to actually have a, uh, a true um, response. And, of course, when we're riding, as much as I'm a rider and riding is very much about a partnership, but, of course, you're kind of the pilot up there. Yeah. You know, you've, got to, you've got to be directing the horse. And in this, we want to... We want to see how the horse is responding naturally to the signals being given to him um, by the group. Yeah. So the horse might plant his feet. He might kind of want to walk off in a different direction, something like that. So therefore, he's not feeling part of that group or he's feeling, okay, someone needs to take the lead. Now, of course, I can't read a horse's mind. I'm just looking from the outside about how that team is working cohesively. Mm. When I see the horse respond like that, I can see something's happening. It might even be really subtle. It might even be that the horse swishes his tail madly before he takes a step with the group. And, you know, depending on the group I'm with, I might actually go in and say, okay, did we notice that? So a horse will swish his tail when he's a bit annoyed about something. So out on a hot day, that's flies, right? But if yeah. there are no flies around, then he's swishing his tail at something else. So it could be that subtle. But right. in the workplace, sometimes the signs are subtle, right? You could have a worker who's doing a job, but they're not very happy. They've never been asked how they're feeling. They haven't yeah. been checked in with, that sort of thing. So they'll do the job to a point, but then there'll come a point where 
they don't want to do it anymore. They haven't been asked how they're feeling about it, how what their opinion is, that sort of thing. So the courses highlight these things in an instant. Wow. Can, can I? I'm really curious. I just want to, st- sticking with your um, the bank group, so I'm thinking about, I suppose, what we call quiet leadership. So if there is a, if there is a, a, a quiet leader, someone who, you know, what you were talking about before, isn't necessarily the boss or the authority. So if you've got a, a quiet leader in the group, the horse will still pick it up because of that sense of safety and trust? Or how, how does that work? Yeah, that works as well. So, of course, yes, it's about the horses, but without, um, you know, trained uh, facilitators or coaches like myself, those may be too subtle to pick up. Mm -hmm. What what I would notice and um, my colleagues, we would notice that the horse is responding to something in the group, right, something. We might know what that is. But, you know, you might have someone who is saying, yep, let's do this, whatever, but... The group isn't with them. So yeah. the horse will pick up on that, right? And then that quiet leader you're talking about, might you might notice as the, as the human facilitator, you might notice someone there trying to say something or, uh, you know, they might have tried to do something or whatever. So you as the facilitator might say, hey, Claire, um, do you have something to add? And then that would be your chance to say, well, you know, I, I think that, you know, we need to take a take a break and talk about it and come up with a strategy before we just head off. Or um, I think we're procrastinating too long and I think we need to get moving. Or, you know, they'll come out with some gem and then you've given that quiet leader a chance to prove themselves and then the horse will be the proof in the pudding then. <laughs> so, so you're telling me that the horse is also teaching us inclusion? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And if you think about it, um, they live in herds and they want to keep the entire herd safe. That's that's what it boils down to. So we kind of we kind of simulate that little herd or group or team in our arena when we work with a horse together. And yes, they absolutely um, that inclusion is part of it as well. You know, it, it's interesting. It's sort of staring you right in the face when you uncover it because we know from all the research that was done by by Google in their project Aristotle and, and from all the sort of um, modern leadership development that psychological safety underpins, you know, every element of cohesive teamwork and, and high-performance teamwork and leadership so they're, they're the living, you know, older than us humans, probably example of, of leadership in action, as you say. Well, absolutely. That is so correct. And, you know, what you were saying too about the 21st leadership being more about, um, you know, uh, shared leadership, shared responsibility. I mean, that really stems from the fact that at the moment things are quite uncertain. So, yeah. you know, in, in the, you know, say, I don't know the time frame I'm talking, but just if you think about if you had the boss at the car production factory, he knew the outcome. It was getting the car out the other end, right? And they had that kind of production line. And maybe that's not a great example. I'm just, you know, pulling this out of my head right now. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there was a, there was a line. It was a line and they, they knew. So you could have a boss who could say, right, you know, we're here now, we want to be here and we want to go there and here's the line we take. At the moment with all the uncertainty, how do we do that? And how can one person, so one leader, be that for a group? They can't. No one can know. So the fact that we are sharing leadership just makes so much more sense. And as you said, horses have been doing this for like centuries. So horses don't know what's around the corner. Wild horses in a herd, they don't know what's over the crest of the hill. Mm. They don't know what's hiding in the woods. They don't know what's um, beyond the stream or in the stream. So they have had to have this shared leadership for near survival um, of their species, I suppose, yeah. the century. So we're just kind of looking to nature for some answers. Yeah. So I love that. I really love that. Wow. And 
I'm wondering, can you share, obviously without giving giving any names or company names away, an example of some aha moments you've had with with leaders around shared leadership or any of these particular aspects that the horses are bringing out? Yep, yep. I've got a really good example from quite recently, actually. We had a um, management consultancy team in and um, they were doing a, a strategy day and they, they kind of hired our facility to do that as well. We've got a room here, as you know, Claire. Mm-hmm. And, but just to break the ice and start the day off, um, it was a new team coming together. We did a session with the horses just as the, at the start of the day. So um, as I explained before, we had a group of people, um, a large group, and we broke them into a couple of teams. Actually, it wasn't that large a group, but we broke them into a couple of teams and they worked together. Um, what we do when we break them into teams, we actually look for um, people that we think might be opposites to work together. Yes. So we, we actually look for that little bit of conflict because I think that once you're out of your comfort zone, that's when you learn. If everything is going along hunky-dory, we're not learning anything. We're just yeah. doing. So we look for that. So we did that. We, we broke the teams up into um, um, senior and junior um, people in the team, which we didn't know other really than their age because mm-hmm. another thing when people come to us, when groups come to us, we don't want to know every single detail about the people because we start to have our own biases so we like we need to know a certain amount so that we can kind of um, uh, we can uh, design our program to suit their objectives. But I don't want to know that oh you know Billy's quite bossy all the time and oh you know um, but Jack's really quiet all the time. I don't want to know that because yeah. the horses bring different things out in people and I don't want to have that bias in me. So I didn't know the um, I didn't know the levels of these people. I just my common sense kind of went younger with older kind mm-hmm. of thing, and you know people they've been at the firm longer. So we did that. And we got working, and we chose um, we designed a program for them or chose a program where the objective was about trust because this was a new team coming together. They hadn't worked together before. There were still parts of, uh, you know, being working, sorry, working remotely with um, the restrictions and things like that. Yeah. So, well, this team needs to trust each other because, um, you know, they're not always going to be together. They, they're not going to be, um, you know, micromanaging, which, we, which none of us like, right? So um, we put them into the teams and one team started working and, they really weren't getting anywhere. Um, by that I mean their horse was, as I cited as an example before, he was really planting his feet. <laughs> so he was not going with them. So they, you know, we, we, we talked them about what might be happening there and and the the guy who kind of, um, it was a guy, who took the lead in a way or thought he was taking the lead, he would look at the obstacle and he'd go, right, we've got to do this, that and the other, right, and he'd kind of start off. And the other human started to step forward with him. But that horse, he just planted his feet. He planted his feet and he wouldn't go, huh, what's happening? So, of course, us humans being humans, I go in and ask what's happening because I'm only facilitating it and I can kind of see what's happening, but I don't know what's behind it, right? Mm -hmm. I think here, oh, he's stubborn. (laughs) He's stubborn. So I'm like, oh, so does this... Are they accusing the horse of being stubborn? Yep, yep, he's stubborn. You know, you know, and, and you'll get things like that. He's stubborn or he doesn't like us, things like that. And I'm like, okay, he doesn't like you. Okay, you've only just met him, you know, kind of thing. So I made a couple of jokes there. But, okay, so you're saying he's stubborn. Okay, so um, what I see is that, you know, he's not wanting to be involved in the team at this moment what can we do to change this and and you know does this happen at work kind of thing hmm they kind of think about it and he's like hmm, yeah but I kind of just keep telling people what to do you yeah, know yeah. so um and we get done eventually hmm okay that's not going to work with this horse is it so we've got to include him somehow so the epiphany or the aha moment that this guy had was that he never actually asks his team how they're feeling, whether they agree, whether they have other ideas on how to, you know, um, do a task, do it something, do a um, project, something like that. And so when he actually stopped to 
talk to the horse and they literally did see how he was feeling at first they felt a bit silly but kind of include him tell him their plan you know so that everything was clear now of course he doesn't understand english or, or human language but he understands that feeling of everyone going oh now i get it wow so the other team member was probably like and again i'm i this is all from my observation so what was going on in their heads we can never know what going, is going on in someone else's head. Yeah. But something happened that that congruence happened between what they were thinking and saying and feeling. So that's the kind of thing the horse picks up. Ah, oh, okay, everyone's feeling easier now. I feel safe being with this team now. We can move on. Gosh. And I would Im- I would imagine then for for some leaders this, it, it, this must feel quite confronting that they're they're being laid bare so to speak absolutely and we do kind of warn our clients of that and I often say as a bit of a almost a dare you've got to be brave enough to listen yeah and but you know what okay I'll just finish that little story before sorry I meant to say his aha moment was in our debrief he said he needed more empathy yeah and his colleagues all around the room they had a little snicker and so my colleague and I thought, yep, that's, that's obviously what everyone's noticed. No one wanted to say it. Mm. The horse pointed it out. So that was his aha moment. Mm. And, um, yeah, what you were saying about it is it really you become very vulnerable because the horse does show it up. But the beautiful thing about that is the horse has no agenda. Yeah. He doesn't have any malice agenda. He doesn't know any politics. So he's not doing it to get ahead to show you up. He's not doing it for any reason like that. So if you are, you know, brave enough to listen to what he's telling you, he or she, we do have miss, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, what they're telling you, then um, you can learn so much about yourself and you can take it on board and think, oh, that's right, I should listen a little more to my colleagues or, oh, maybe I do need to be a little bit more direct. They didn't quite get what I meant or whatever that lesson is for you. Yeah. You could take so much away from it. Absolutely. And and I think to be able to have, you know, an, an impartial um, coach, advisor, consultant, observer, whatever you want to call them, is, is part of creating that environment of safety. And for them to go back and reflect and, and think, Okay, so how you know the, it, it's it's a it's a starter, it's a foundation for the conversation back at work, and and you know talking about vulnerability, this is one of the key themes through almost every podcast that I do is the courage to be vulnerable, you know that that to for 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 everyone to wake up that that vulnerability is not a weakness that it's actually hugely courageous it must be so rewarding jane it is so rewarding and another thing uh, you know i'd like to point out is that you know even though you know myself and my colleagues are running these programs we're not immune so that's the other great thing if we're not having a great day or something we're distracted the horses point that out as well <laughs> We can't hide either, which makes it hopefully a little more inviting as well. It's not like we've got some secret that we, you know, yes, I I've, I know how to read a horse's, um, you know, responses or at least say to someone, he is responding, she is responding, what does that mean for you? Yeah. But I'm not immune. And, in fact, sometimes I've, um, I'm much better now. When I started out, I would see something amazing happen and I would step in and comment and I would, I would break the spell or that magic happening in that little team. So I've learned to I step back and observe quite a bit and, and let that moment happen without me interfering because I'm an element in there as well. So part of that facilitation for us is to step back and allow this process to happen, allow the horses to be the fantastic teachers that they can be and allow that to happen. I think, well, you've just, you know, you've just put a mirror up to me uh, as a facilitator that so often we, out of our enthusiasm and passion for the role that we have, yeah. um, we want to 
point something out. And actually, this is a uh, this is actually a newsletter that I'm writing today about about potentially robbing people of insight and aha moments and and what that does. But when when we stay quiet and allow that magic to unfold, then that learning is so much deeper and and lasting and implementable back in the workplace. So it's a yes, it's a good reminder and lesson for, for us as facilitators as well. Oh, it really, really is. And and when I train people in this, um, and, and it takes practice, as you know, Claire, to be that kind of a coach, but that's one thing I emphasise is just, you know, allow the process to happen because it's not our journey as the as the coach, as the leadership coach, it's our client's journey. Yeah. And we've got to allow them to discover that. And exactly what you said, when they do that self-discovery is when the learning is the most powerful. Yeah. And that's where, as you said, um, about having the impartiality of the horse, that's a great thing because no one's judging you. No matter what you say or do, no one's judging you. Mm. They're not responding to you. And there's so many great lessons to be learned through that, um, you know, if you take it on board the right way. Um, but, yeah, as you said as well, vulnerability, you know, does take courage um, because laying yourself kind of open I mean, it, it does feel uncomfortable, but I think it's where those great learning moments happen. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about some, some of the, the key aspects of leadership that the horses are drawing out, we've spoken briefly about inclusion. We've spoken about trust and safety. Um, what else can these wonderful four-legged coaches help us to learn and understand? Oh, well, that's a really great question. So our programs touch on so many objectives. So I I think I said before that, you know, they help us on building relationships as well. Mm -hmm. They help us um, in that teamwork environment. That's a really huge thing about working with horses because they live in um, herds themselves and that's their comfort zone. And I think that in itself is a parallel. We actually have a saying, um, herds are to horses as teams are to people. So we need to, yeah, we need to work together, right? Um, even in our like our family, um, our sporting teams, our work environment, we're always with other people, and we need to learn how to work with them. And I think that's one of the key things that they teach us. Um, the other thing that I think they've shown me is how. The, those, um, you know, you spoke before or we, we chatted before about that quiet leader. Yeah. That's fascinated me how a natural leader emerges. So it really fascinates me because, you know, I watch like a group of kids, you know, and you watch, um, you'll just see them all looking to this one child. What is it about that child? And same when I have groups here, what is it about that one person or, you know, even watching my horses, what is it about that one horse that they all look to? What is it? And it's fascinating how those leaders emerge, I think. Wow. Um, Yeah, it really is. And I think that I've just been so surprised by um, that. For example, exactly going back to that bank, you know, when I asked my group who they thought the leader, the titled leader was, they all said, pretty much unanimously one person. And funnily enough, that person was the executive assistant to the leader, which we all thought was <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just great? And probably, you know, anyone listening is probably going, yep, 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 my EA is also the boss around here, really. <laughs> I think most leaders know that their EA is really the boss. Exactly. So- <laughs> But, and also it wasn't in a, you know, it's not that horses respond to anyone being um, bossy or telling them what to do. You know, that doesn't work. Yeah. It's, uh, unless that is really congruent and that's what needs to be done. Or, or, if, or if the horses are maybe feeling unsafe. Yeah, exactly. And you step up and take that role for them. Exactly right. But it needs to be authentic. Yeah. You, need to, you can't kind of go, oh, I think this is what we do. If you're saying... This is what we do, but you're thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure. They pick up on that. Yeah. Equally, you know, I've had days where I've said to my horses, I'm not sure what's happening today, but I verbalise it. And, again, of course, they don't understand the words, but I think they understand when I've verbalised it. So for me, talking is a release. Yeah. So if I, if I say it out loud, 
it's out there, it's no longer caged up inside me, it's no longer, you know, that feeling in my tummy where you go, oh, I'm not sure, I've said it out loud. Yeah. We can come to some sort of an action together. And I think that that's a key thing as well, that, you know, I mightn't have all the answers even if I'm saying, okay, I run leading edge, um, you know, professional development. I don't have all the answers always. So it's great to be able to admit that and ask for um, help from your team. And horses are great at that as well. Uh, and and that's why uh, you know that that we've decided that we want to collaborate because it's we we have ex, you know such similar philosophies on this and and a desire to bring this natural leadership philosophy to the masses. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted again quickly to come back to talking about natural leadership. So, from your experience from that great team that you worked in at SAP from from all your work since what would you what would you say in your opinion Jane are the are the critical elements of natural leadership you know what I actually think it boils down to being the real you Mm. I think that's a huge part of it I think that people respect and horses respect (laughs) when you're really honest mm. and authentic about who you are. I think having that pretense, you know, we humans sense that as well when someone's not being real with us. Yeah. The horses sense it and just show it up in that moment. And so I think that when we finally go, well, actually, I'm not sure about this, everyone breathes a sigh of relief. In our arena, the horses will literally go, oh, I'm going to imitate a horse now. <sighs> You know, and take a big breath out. That often happens and they will lower their head and you will notice them physically relax and it's like, oh, it's out there. Wow. It's out there. We can now discuss it because it's out there. And I think that that's a really huge thing. I think for a leader to be able to say, I don't have the answer, I need help, is one of the greatest aspects a leader can have, like a just to be able to say, I don't have all the answers, but together we can come up with something. Thank you. Um, before we before we wind up, I'm curious. Um, so you know, we have we have great leaders, we have mediocre leaders, we sometimes have terrible leaders. Um, have you ever have you ever um, had to discipline or sack one of your co coaches that wasn't? Listening? Oh, I love that question. (laughs) Yes. So, yes, in fact, we have. So part of um, this uh, equine-assisted experience is at the top of our list is the welfare of everyone involved in our program. So the welfare is obviously physical welfare but also psychological welfare. So I wouldn't want to force any of my human coaches to keep doing a job they weren't Mm -hmm. 100% behind and equally with our horses. So, for example, when I started this, um, this exact work, so I've been working intensively with horses for the past decade when I moved to um, the property with it, you know, Um, and I started this kind of leadership work in 2015. When I started, I became certified and things like that. When I started out, I... I only had the two horses. They are still here. They're still part of our herd and our family. But one of them, he became a little bit what I call sour with the job. So within our training for people, we have, um, you know, we tell people how to look out for these sort of things and to see whether um, whether the horse has is, you know, does not want to do this job anymore or whether it's just a matter of reminding him um, about a few horse etiquette matters. So you can imagine that the people who come here, they may have never touched a horse before, and when we interact with each other, we're learning things from each other. So equally, our horses learn things that I might want them to learn from people who are coming here because they've got no idea about kind of, you know, equestrian etiquette, right, which is fair enough, and that's not their responsibility, and it shouldn't be. So it might be, I, I thought at first, oh, is he just not, is he just overstepping boundaries and because my clients have allowed him to, he's overstepping boundaries. 
or is he really sour at the job? So when I worked with him or when my daughter, who's also a, um, so a certified, uh, uh, well, she's a riding coach and all that and a certified facilitator, you know, when either of us worked with him or anyone else in our team, he was fine. But when we put him with clients, he was what I call sour. So what that looks like was he was kind of putting his ears back at people and, and threatening to give them a nip. Now, he didn't, but it's like, you know, I'm like, oh, no, that's not the behaviour of our horses we work with. They, they tell us very clearly when they're not happy, but it doesn't look like that, right? And so I thought, hmm, okay. So I worked with him for a while and then I finally realised, not finally, it didn't take me long, I realised that he didn't want to do this work anymore. Wow. So he told me quite clearly, but as I said, I had to kind of ask him a few questions like you would an employee. So what is it? Is it is it the work or, you know, are we not listening to you? And I think that he just wasn't loving the work anymore. And so we decided not to have him in programs. Now, we gave him a long break from that and he um, he went back to his other job of being a riding horse. And um, nowadays I will bring him in if I'm running a two-day um, retreat whereby we have four sessions within the two days with the horses. Mm -hmm. I'll bring him in for one of those and he's fine. But he doesn't want to be the horse that's here every day doing this sort of work. What a lesson. <laughs> I know, I know. And, you know, again, I think everything that we do with the horses, we can parallel back to us humans. And the horses are just so clear about it that, that um, you know, sometimes you might say, gosh, he was trying to tell me a little while ago he wasn't happy. It took for him to pin his ears back at someone where I went, oh, yeah. I like him, to give me a really loud signal that he wasn't happy for me to take note. And for that... You know, this was a few years ago now. And for that, I berate myself, but I was learning. And again, that vulnerability, it's, you know, those yeah. things are hard for me to say. Oh, I made a bit of a, a judgment error in judgment. So now I'm, he's taught me to be fully aware of my whole team. Yeah. You know, humans, horses, everything. Yeah. Ooh, you know, just keep that radar out. Watch for those signs. You know, um, the body language is huge with humans and horses. So watch those sort of signs and see and then ask the question, you know, are you okay? What's going on? Are you okay? Like, you know, let's have a, talk, let's have a discussion about it. Let's see what's going on there really. Uh, and, and verbal and written warnings would have just ended up in you getting a kick. <laughs> I know, I know. See, and we avoided that. So that was good. Exactly. Seek first to understand. That's that's exactly right. And, you know, um, just for, for people listening there, the horses that we work with we are chosen for their temperaments. So this horse was, was one of those horses as well, gorgeous temperament, um, loves working with people, all that sort of thing. So for him to get to a point for me to um, say, okay, you, you've had enough, buddy, yeah. um, is, you know, really interesting and it's given me a great life lesson about um, anyone I work with. I, you know, I, I was going to round it up there, but I've got one. I've got one more question, which is more of a practical question. Sure. So, given given that the horses, you know, pick up on so much, they're so intuitive. What if what if one of the team members um, has a fear of horses? Uh, how how does how do they then gel? That's a really good question, and many. Many, many, many of our um, participants have fear of horses when they first arrive because if you imagine if you haven't had anything to do with them, as we said before, they weigh upward of like four or 500 kilos. So that's a lot of, lot of animal there to work with when you haven't been comfortable with them. So what we do is we always give um, a talk about how and why we work with our horses and we show people how we work with them. We also say that it's fine if you're not feeling that comfortable. You've got a team there. So working together with your team, you usually find a role within that team where you can ease into working with the horse and right. be the one that may take the lead rope. And I would say it is 100% the case so far that the person who's been fearful has been able to step up and lead that horse around. Wow. I've even had someone say in the end they forgot he was a horse. Mm. It was just part of the team, mm. which is the ultimate for me because that's what they are. They're part of the team. 
Oh, <laughs> Jane, I mean, I, I can't wait for us to, to work together and to co-facilitate and, and everybody coming back face to face as well. I've, um, I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm naturally extroverted anyway, but I have so, so missed um, being face to face. And oh, well, I totally hear you, Claire, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this has probably been one of the most fascinating conversations that we've had on authentic leadership. You know, we really didn't know where it was going to go, but I, I suppose that's that sort of leading by example with our with our equine friends is just to trust the process. Well, that's right. And you know, we started off. You know, our our title is leadership in action, and. And that's it. Once we get out there with the horses, it is leadership in action because the horses magically close that little loop for us. So yeah. if something's not going right, in the moment we can kind of, the, or the, the participant can um, problem solve for themselves why that isn't working and yeah. close that loop. It's a magical feedback loop right in that moment. And and that's, again, it's so important in leadership. You know, it, it, gone are the days of a performance management conversation where somebody tells somebody how they're performing once a year. Yeah. But these tiny tweaks, these tiny recalibrations, this agreement of how do we get back on track is absolutely critical. Absolutely, absolutely. And as we said before, in these times where things are changing so um, frequently, we can't just have one path and say, right, here's your path for the next three months, six months, year. We don't know. So we do have to check in with each other all the time about yeah. how it's going. And, you know, that's the other thing. A group may have done one obstacle and it's great. Then something happens and their horse walks away from them, plants his feet, swishes his tail, does something like that. So I'm like, so what happened here? What's different to the last one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, last time we made a plan or, you know, last time we knew what we were going, you know, we were all on the same page. Now we're not so sure. Something changes. Yeah. So it's literally leadership in action. It can simulate what's going on in a company, you know, within like we're only with the horses for, say, 40 minutes and, and that can unfold and have, there can be so many aha moments in just that short time. So they're a real accelerator uh, a good barometer and a good accelerator as to what's happening within a team. Perfectly summed up, Jane. Thank you so much. Now, I, I will put all the details on the show notes and, and the website but and your LinkedIn, if that's okay, if people can course, contact you through you. LinkedIn. Um, but just to remind everybody, what's your, what's your website? It's leadingedgeprofessionaldevelopment.com.au. Thank you so much. Go well. And um, I can't wait to catch up and, and work with you and, and, and the team, the equine team. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. That was fantastic. Bye, Jane. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. And we hope that this conversation provided the insights and inspiration that you were looking for. Did you know that Raw Authentic Leadership is currently ranking eighth in the top 25 Australian leadership podcasts? You can help us get to number one by heading over to Apple iTunes and doing three quick things. Subscribing, giving us a positive rating, and writing a short review. This is the most effective way for us to get the key messages around 21st century leadership out into the business community. And before you go, if you or your people are needing to boost their resilience muscle and master thriving in change, then please head over to the BrainSmart website and take a look at our Dealing with Change and Building Resilience program. The website is brain-smart.com. Go well, stay safe, and keep listening and learning.